So Games Workshop, just today, had released a new preview stream and talked about a whole bunch of new Necron stuff, which is sick. And then an unending tirade of Space Marine releases. So, hope everyone got their fill of not Space Marine stuff with, you know, the seven Necron things they previewed, because we're going to be talking about Space Marines forever. So let's talk about all the new releases that were previewed on the September 12th GW livestream. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name, as always, is Trevi, and today we're going to be talking about some of the new releases that were previewed during Games Workshop's preview stream here on September 12th. First of all, we got some new Necron stuff, which is sick. I'm uh, really excited to see Necrons get an overhaul. They've been sort of done dirty for a long time, and it does look like the new Codex is going to bring some drastically new things to the faction. Not just new units and new characters like the Silent King himself, but also some new overarching rules. And I do hope that this is a sign of things to come for Games Workshop's design philosophy going on into the future. One thing I don't think I've talked about in a video before is that in Games Workshop's design team, there's a big dichotomy between the Age of Sigmar designers and the 40k designers. Age of Sigmar has a lot more uh, modern design philosophies behind it, and every faction has unique mechanics and interesting abilities, uh, whereas 40k, basically everyone plays the same game, and uh, you just have different stats on your guns, essentially. But it does look like that in 9th edition, the new codexes are going to try to start moving away from that, and combat doctrines in 8th edition, mechanics like that were a good way for Games Workshop to start implementing these sort of overarching faction-specific mechanics, and it looks like that's something that we're, we're going to get something similar in this new Necron Codex. I'll just go through some of the, the new rules that we saw previewed. So first of all, Necrons get access to a new mechanic called uh, something protocols, command protocols, but they are essentially a version of the combat doctrine mechanic specifically for Necrons. How it works, as far as I could tell from the video, is that you will set protocol abilities and you will set a an order in which you enact them. Each of the command protocols is modal, and so ever, whenever you get to the turn with that protocol enacted, uh, you get to pick one of two directive abilities that uh, will become active for your army. So it, effectively, uh, it's like combat doctrines, but you get to order your combat doctrines in whatever way you want. And then once you get there, you have an option of two abilities that you can use to give you a little bit more flexibility. I really like this mechanic. I think it one of the things that Necrons have always sort of been is this kind of uh, unstoppable, like, sort of robotic, you know, force. They sort of slowly march up the table. They're not particularly tactically flexible, but they have, you know, the unstoppable power of the Aeons behind them. And I think giving them these these sort of combat doctrine mechanics is really cool. In addition, I'm a big sucker for player choice, so being able to orient your command protocols in whatever way you want before the game starts, I think, will be sick. I don't know if they mentioned in the video, and I, maybe I didn't catch it, I'm I'm not entirely sure how these uh, mechanics work it, totally. It looks like... So the wording of the directive specifically is a little bit confusing, and I actually got a little bit confused myself while recording the first take of this video. But from what I gathered from the live stream, each of the directives is an army-wide ability that will give every model in your army an ability matching the wording of the directive. So when it says this unit can do X, it's not that you pick a unit that does it. It's that every model in your army can can do that thing. So it will either give all of your aura abilities plus three inches of range, which is great, or it will give your entire army basically the Ultramarines chapter tactic to fall back and shoot at minus one to hit. And especially in a game where if you can look ahead into the future and you know what turn your opponent is going to engage you, especially if they're playing a melee army, this protocol can be really brutal to them, giving you even more options to fall back and shoot, even on top of the new uh, Royal Warden character that came out in Indominus. So, for example, if your opponent's playing a very fast army, you might want to enact this protocol on the bottom of one or top of two if you're playing against, you know, jet bikes or something super quick. Otherwise, uh, turn two, I think a lot of times you'd want this ability to fall back and shoot against an assault army, but some assault armies are pretty slow, and, and Necrons do have the ability to, to, to chew through a lot of, uh, you know, models that are coming at them very quickly, so maybe you want to save it until turn three if your opponent, you don't think your opponent's really going to get mixed up on objectives until turn three. It's it's very cool, and I think these sort of finesse abilities are going to really make the game more interesting tactically, and flavorfully, obvi uh, obviously, as well, so uh, this is going to, this is a sick uh, mechanic. I'm very excited to see factions get their own unique mechanics, like Games Workshop, it seems like, has a, a thing for just sort of reusing, re 
rehashing the same mechanic over and over again. We saw that in, in Psychic Awakening, where a bunch of different factions got access to, like, the tank ace abilities, essentially. Uh, very uh, sort of similar abilities like that. Hopefully, it's not all just sort of Combat Doctrines clones, and we can uh, get some more interesting stuff going on, but we'll see how it goes. To piggyback off that, we did see a new dynasty trait, faction, sub-faction trait for the Sarakin dynasty, which uh, they did say in the video was the dynasty of the Silent King himself. So probably if you are bringing that model, your detachment will probably have to be from this sub-faction. It has a couple of abilities. You have the basically the Black Templar's uh, mortal wound ignoring trait, uh, which is fine, but nobody's really super excited about that. The big deal, I think, uh, most importantly, is that you get kind of half of Master Artisans. Every time you shoot or fight, you can reroll one wound roll. So you don't get the hit roll reroll, which is fine. I mean, you have access to My Will Be Done, which has been buffed, as we saw in Indomitus, to affect vehicles too. Getting one wound roll on top of that is extremely good, especially for the big vehicles. Uh, stuff like uh, Doom Scythe and Doomsday Arcs are with a limited number of shots, but very high value shots, is going to really smooth over the variance that those guys usually suffer. So I, I do think that this is probably a pretty reasonable pick for a, for a dynasty trait. Uh, and then on top of that, we also see that uh, if you have one of these particular protocols active, uh, these command protocols active, uh, in, this, in this case, the Protocol of the Undying Legions, which I don't believe that we know uh, what it does yet, you also get an additional ability. You get to enact both of the directives. So the two modal abilities, you get to get both of them. You don't have to pick one. So there is an additional incentive to play into... So there's an additional incentive to play into the command protocols that the sub-faction would be running, you know, sort of flavorfully, which I think is very cool as well. And it will be interesting to see if all of the dynasties have a specific command protocol that they are sort of built around. I think that is uh, an interesting direction to go for those abilities. It's basically, it's a kind of like a it's kind of like a super faction or a super doctrine trait uh, from Space Marines, where uh, they get a special ability when their their chosen or their preferred combat doctrine is active. Uh, these guys basically get the same thing, except for uh, these command protocols. So there we go. We're just everybody's just playing Space Marines now. We also got some new units previewed, which is gonna be sweet. Uh, on top of the stuff in Indominus, we got. Uh, we've also been seeing around the, the place a, uh, a bunch of different Necron models that have been popping up. And now we uh, finally get a couple stats and a couple more abilities uh, for them so we can f you know finally judge whether these guys are going to be worth it. This unit is the Ophidian Destroyers. They mentioned during the stream that these guys are very uh, much more a sort of ambush predator centric. So instead of just using their movement to get across the table and their survivability like wraiths, they uh, actually just deep strike, which is pretty cool. Hopefully that they can they can actually get into melee uh, once they deep strike. That's the issue with a lot of um, centric units where they're they're keyed around melee, but they have a tough time actually making their nine inch charge once they pop up. Very much like the Scorpec Destroyers, these guys have a single model equipped with a big punchy weapon, and then everyone else gets little dinky weapons. <laughs> <laughs> so one person is going to get this Hyperphase Reap Blade, which is a big three damage uh, uh, melee weapon at AP minus four, which is pretty sweet. Almost You're almost getting a Thunder Hammer. Unfortunately, the, the base stats of these models aren't super impressive. Uh, it looks like we're coming out of Strength 4, Toughness 4, which is kind of disappointing. Three attacks each is nice, but only at a three of weapon skill, uh, although you can buff that up with uh, My Will Be Done, so that should be okay. Uh, and then I think, unfortunately, only a four plus save. Uh, which is kind of crazy, and as far as I can see, there's no invulnerable save on these guys, so they are just going to probably get beat the crap up once they jump out, but I guess uh, the, the idea is to have them as an Alpha Strike unit, so I, I guess it's that, not the end of the world. Um, interestingly, when I saw the preview of the, the models, I thought this was a gun. <laughs> it's on the edge of their sword, so I was like, oh, sweet, they're going to have an assault weapon or something, uh, but it doesn't look like they do, so that's Pretty disappointing, to be honest, uh, especially for a unit that wants to deep strike. You, you usually want guns on those guys. They're at a power rating of five, so we're looking at probably 100-ish points, 90 to 100 points for three of them. So about 30 points a model, which is pretty expensive. Uh, the damage output that you get in melee is pretty uh, pretty decent with the reap blades. You additional uh, Additionally, everyone else has a two damage weapon with plus one attack, although they're only sitting at that uh, strength four which is going to make it hard to crack any big armor with it. Although, I mean, honestly, the difference between Strength 4 and Strength 6 
It's not that big of a deal. I'm really, this uh, strength four is, is kind of throwing me right now for these guys. They do have a little bit of defensive tech in that they're minus one to be hit in melee, uh, which is fine, although not great. There's a, usually, you know, you're going to have some special weapons and squads that give themselves a penalty to hit. You know, it's things like uh, thunder hammers and power fists are already minus one to hit, so they, they don't, they ignore that. So it's not the greatest defense. And uh, once you get the hits through, it's going to deal some significant damage to this unit. So um, really, they just want to be killing whatever they charge before it gets to swing back at them, I think is, is the goal. Uh, they also have obviously uh, just a standard sort of reserve deep strike ability, which is fine. They have the standard destroyer cult rule for reroll ones to hit, and they have additionally the uh, the reap blade has exploding sixes in melee, uh, which is nice to have, especially for a high value attack like that. But only three attacks. It's gonna. It's not. It's not a ton. Um, and unfortunately, it's unmodified sixes. So you don't. You can't even. Uh, you can't even. Uh, my will be done it to, to explode on fives. Um, it'll be interesting to see if this unit sees some play. I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not versed enough in Necron list building to really, <laughs> to really judge them comparatively to the rest of the faction. They don't seem great to me, to be honest. I think the survivability is a real issue. And uh, the fact that they're designed around deep striking and then charging, and that's you, unless you have some really big buffs to charge, that's usually not an amazing uh, plan to go with, especially in ninth edition with a smaller board where it's a little bit harder to get um, interesting placements places uh maybe as a as a backline sort of objective holder they're okay they are infantry so they can perform actions but i think necrons have some uh, more efficient options to do that if they really need it so um we'll see how these guys go um I i'm not super impressed by this data sheet to be honest but uh i'm not a necron player so who knows we also saw some new models previewed for a couple new Cryptech variants to go uh, to, to keep company with the, the Plasmancer from Indominus. And I'm excited about these characters. I think they are going to add some interesting uh, dynamics to the Necron faction. The Plasmancer himself uh, didn't, really, didn't really do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like so uh, these guys might actually have some powerful support abilities, which so I'm very excited to see how they fit into the faction as a whole. First up, we have the Chronomancer, who has a Chronometron, uh, and we get to see the new updated rules for the Chronometron. Obviously, the Chronometron in 8th edition, or in the 8th edition book, was an upgrade for standard Cryptex, which uh, just gave a 3-inch, 5-plus invulnerable save aura to infantry units, I should say, specifically, uh, which is pretty good. Um, it's not amazing, but it does, because he's just units and not models, uh, you could chain back, you know, Necron Warriors or Immortals or, or um, stuff like that to it and to give them a little bit of uh, additional defense. Uh, most lists didn't really build around infantry, though, so you, you never really saw it. This ability is much different. It's been changed uh, pretty significantly. Um, it's a targeted ability, so he, he has to point the chronometron at somebody and, and supercharge them with time magic, I guess. If you do so, they get a 5 plus invulnerable save for the round, and they reroll charge rolls. So... We were just talking about the, in, the the difficulty of making charges out of Deep Strike, and that is one way to make it a little bit more useful for those Deep Striking units like the uh, the uh, Ophidian Destroyers. Uh, unfortunately, you can't stack this with the My Will Be Done um, now that if, if My Will Be Done uh, retains the wording that it had in Indomitus, where it only adds plus one to your hit. It doesn't add plus one to your move or charges anymore. Um, so you're just going to be looking for a nine inch rerollable without any uh, additional buffs in there, which is a little bit tough. But um, I think a five plus invulnerable save that you can just target on stuff is pretty. Notice that it's, uh, it's not infantry units anymore. It's just friendly dynasty units, which means that you can give, hear me out, an invulnerable save to your doomsday arcs. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Um, so I actually do think that this guy is probably very eminently playable. Um, just having a targetable five plus invulnerable save is really nice and it's difficult to get rid of. It's not like you, you know, you pick a, a unit at the start of the game and give them a five plus invulnerable save and then if they die, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a doomsday arc and your opponent has to shoot it, then they're going to be going through a quantum shielding and the five plus invulnerable save. And then even if it dies, you, uh, you just get to pick a different one. So, um, you get to sw swap it out for whatever is, um, is uh, in most danger. So I actually really like this guy and I really like this new chronometron rules. I wasn't sure if I liked them as much as the aura ability, but I think I do. <laughs> I think it's way better. Um, it's also a nine inch range, so you don't have to really keep him super close to stuff. He can stay in the back and sort of do other things, which is great. Um, yeah, I'm very impressed by this, uh, by this new chronomancer. I think the interesting thing is going to be whether or not the, the standard cryptech data sheet survives. <laughs> Maybe cryptechs just get get bl blown into these very different varieties of, uh, of, of Cryptech. Maybe the standard Cryptech keeps the Technomancer's abilities, uh, for, so, so they're kind of more 
based around reanimating stuff and they lose their special upgrade. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But I actually, but I do think that this, uh, this Chronomancer, it's going to be pretty good. Hopefully it's just a big stick and shoot laser beams. The Nightmare Shroud is back. And this time it's also not a relic. It's just an ability, which is pretty crazy. Back in the day when I played in like third edition, you said Nightmare Shroud was, I think it was just an upgrade that you could give to overlords. It was always destroyer lords would get it. And it just forced, I think it forced a, like an, a leadership check on everyone within like 18 inches of you at minus one. And then they would just run off the table. It was like really brutal, actually. <laughs> Especially if you got it off turn one. I think you would like, you could veil of darkness a dude right up the table and then pop a nightmare shroud on them. And they would like their whole army would run off on turn one. That was in eighth edition. It obviously it became a relic that basically it, it, gave, it had a six inch or of minus one leadership basically like this rule does in it it also give you plus one to your armor save this time around it's a new uh, ability on the psychomancer the scary skull face guy and this one uh still a six inch aura minus one leadership and i think more importantly minus one to combat attrition tests taken for the unit so that means that when you fail your leadership check uh, during the morale phase. One model automatically flees, obviously. Then other, everyone else in the unit will run on a one or a two. If they're below half, you uh, have an additional penalty to that. And it's a 50-50 that they stick around. On, on a one, two, or three, they're going to flee. You need a four or five or six to keep them in the fight. And that's pretty brutal, to be honest. The downside is that this aura is only six inches. Maybe the Psychomancer's got some additional abilities we haven't seen yet, but... Um, uh, it's a powerful effect. Minus one to combat attrition chest is actually pretty insane. And it's going to be good if you're playing into an aggressive army that's coming at you and forcing a bunch of combat attrition on them. Usually a lot of horde lists, you know, things like orcs and stuff. Um, once they get to the point where they can actually start failing morale, uh, they, they break like sort of instantaneously. They Combat attrition for large units is so much more brutal than morale rules in 8th edition, especially for big units of like 30 models, where if you kill 5 or 6, they could lose you know, another five or six from combat attrition, especially if they're taking it at a minus one. So if you're playing defensively into an army like that, uh, I think a six inch aura like this is actually pretty insane. Uh, that said, uh, you're, you're not going to do that every day. And most people in 40 K just shoot you with missile launchers. So I don't know. Uh, this is probably bad, but, um, it's an, it's an interesting ability, and uh, the designers in the video were pretty they were pretty excited to show people some additional interaction with the with the morale mechanic. Uh, it seems fine, but uh, six inch aura is like so small, <laughs> especially since uh, most of the time we're gonna be playing Space Marines. You don't even take uh, don't even take combat attrition tests ever, so who cares? We also got a preview for some new rules for Flayed Ones. Everyone's excited about Flayed Ones all the time. For some reason, Flayed Ones, I feel like, have a real cult following in the Necron community. I'm not sure why that is. I think they're pretty silly, but uh, to each their own. Um, and unfortunately, they're generally also bad. The design team was very excited to preview this new rule. They didn't give us a data sheet. I would have liked to have seen a data sheet. But the new rule is that if you attack a, a non-vehicle unit, um, they get exploding sixes. Um which is, I mean, that's fine. That is a-okay. It obviously will expand uh, or be, get more powerful if they have a lot of attacks, uh, but I don't know how many attacks they're going to have, so who knows? It is also, like we just talked about with the Ophidian Destroyers, it's, on, it's only unmodified rolls of six, so it's not, uh, you don't get to my will be done it into five plus to explode. It doesn't seem like it's a rule that's really going to change anyone's opinions on uh, flayed ones, but maybe they'll be really good. Uh, I won't hold out hope for the poor flayed ones, but they do get a new model kit, so that's pretty sweet. We also saw some additional rules for Crusade. I'm not really going to go into those right now. I don't have any experience with the Crusade format, so I'm not the perfect, the, the greatest person to talk about that. Uh, and we saw a little bit of a preview for the stat block of the Silent King himself, which I think, I believe we had already seen. I don't think anything new was, uh, was spoiled there, but uh, it's nice to see that the Silent King is going to have a whole boatload of wounds and be really hard to kill. Also, less than 18 wounds, so he will be blocked by obscuring terrain, which is pretty sick. Um, I like the idea of hiding this like, <laughs> like 10 story tall flying chair. Um, but with that, I hope we are uh, excited to finish talking about Necrons because we're going to talk about more Space Marines. Yeah. We got a bunch of spoilers for the new Codex and the many new Codexes that will follow. Uh, it's funny, I started just over a year ago in 8th edition 40k, and just about right after I started, like literally this time last year, um, we got the new Space Marine Codex, and 
So the Space Marine releases have not stopped yet. They're still a whole year later. We're still getting them. So I don't know. Let's talk about them and let's get going with some with some positivity. Uh, instead, we'll talk about the fact that the Master of Sanctity rule still exists. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it, it's uh, going to be a little bit different. Master of Sanctity, uh, basically it does the same thing that it did. You get to recite an additional litany and you know an additional litany. How this works, we don't know. I assume that it's the same system as in Psychic Awakening, where you spend a CP to give someone the Master of Sanctity rule and ability. I'm not sure, though. I think the rumor is that you may pay actual points for it. Uh, you also get access to a couple of Relics and Warlord traits, just as you did in... 8th edition, um, in ninth, it looks like Wise Order is a little bit different. Uh, instead of getting to reroll your failed litanies, you get plus one to, to for them to go off, which is a little bit less good than uh, reroll, but it's just it's mathematically pretty close. It looks like there's a new uh, stratagem here called com uh, Commanding Oratory. And it only costs one CP if you uh, if it's being used on a wise orator. I imagine that's a reroll to your litany. Maybe it's like reroll all your litanies for the turn for two CP or something like that. Interesting that it it goes from whatever cost it was to one CP when you're using it. The Emperor's Judgment is a relic um, that gives your character it, it can't be rerolled against. It's kind of like the custody is the new custody stratagem. Sure, that seems good. Uh, it sounds like they're going to be sort of curtailing a lot of the reroll abilities in the game. We already. Saw the Zerakin sort of master artisan's ability is only reroll wound rolls. I believe the Salamanders one is moving to only reroll hit rolls. The the rumor has it that Chapter Master is uh, is now going to be target unit rerolls and hit rolls instead of everyone within six. So um, that might be a little bit less important than it has in the past. It also means that you can't like CP reroll to cheekily kill your opponent's characters, which is it's pretty nice. It's a nice ability to have. Uh, in addition, it has this garbage ability. Uh, where you roll two dice and discard the lowest result. Obviously, this isn't a Space Marine uh, faction, so you can probably reroll any um, morale test that you want as well on top of that. So basically, you go from... Uh, you're, it's also on a Master of Sanctity, so you're losing, using his leadership, which is like 9 or 10 usually. So um, it's... <laughs> That's the that's just that's just adding tomatoes to tomato soup right there. I think you are you go from being already basically immune to morale to being even more immune to morale. Take that. So uh, I don't think that this relic is really anything we're talking about. Probably nobody's going to take that. But it's nice to see that Master of Sanctity is still in the game, and we still get to deal with Primaris Chaplains reciting two litanies a turn. Uh, good, good stuff. Speaking of things that already exist in the game and will continue to exist, uh, here's a picture of an Eradicator with a multi melta. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it was worse than having Eradicator shoot you six times with massive damage, uh, high efficiency weapons is them shooting you 12 times. <laughs> um, great. That's going to be fun. But they do give themselves minus one to hit like for having a heavy weapon and probably having to move, um, which is, I don't. I mean, that doesn't matter. Uh, if the cost isn't significantly worse, then they're still going to be just... It's still more efficient. They're just doubling the number of attacks you make. Gross. I'm... Uh, this is disgusting. Anyway, uh, Meltas give uh, D6 plus 2 damage within half range. We already knew that. We saw that from the Invader data sheet. So this is in place of the existing Melta rule that lets you reroll the damage roll. This is, I think, just to make things a little bit more streamlined. It's obviously, I think, a lot better than having reroll the damage roll. You spike higher and your floor is is, is better. Uh, I mean, if a flat three damage on a Melta is pretty good. So they also mentioned that every Melta weapon in the game would be getting this ability. I think we knew that already, but it was nice to have some additional confirmation of that. So I imagine that also affects fusion weapons as well. Uh, so things like fusion pistols out of Harlequins and the, all the fusion blasters out of Tau. Um, I don't think, I don't know if there's many other Melta style weapons in the game, but hopefully they get updated too. And I do hope that we do see some stat line increases because we're going to be seeing some, uh, some real insane weapon stat lines coming out of the new Space Marines. Speaking of Meltas, uh, we have, uh, so some of the new Storm Speeder rules. So these guys, we got a fuzzy picture of these, like... Like six months ago, uh, longer than that, like almost a full year ago, I think we got a really fuzzy picture of a, a Blood Angel Storm Speeder, and everyone freaked out because Primaris Land Speeders are going to be a thing, and we finally get to see the model and the rules. This thing has three variants. It has the hammer strike that we see here. This is the only data sheet that we got for it. It also has the hail strike, which looks like it's going to be maybe a little bit uh, less expensive, but focus more on anti-infantry firepower, as well as the thunder strike, which is probably going to be even more heavy armor killing centric. So 
Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the, the differences between all of these. Um, it, it does look like the Thunderstrike has less weapons on it. Uh, it, it has... Uh, it looks like it has a missile launcher in place of the, the Crackstorm grenade launchers here. It also has a Laz Talon on the front, as well as what might be um, a more powerful missile launcher. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, whereas the Hail Strike is coming in with um, some Iron Hail Heavy Stubbers on the top instead in place of the missile launchers. Uh, it has an Onslaught Gatling Cannon here, and it has Frag Storm Grenades here. Uh, so just putting out an immense immense amount of Strength 4 and Strength 5 shooting. Um, I don't know which one's going to be the best because we haven't seen all the data sheets yet, but it does look like the, uh, this this one is a little bit more mid-range, and uh, that may be the way to go. Uh, so what do we have on this thing? First of all, the stat block uh, is right here. They're Toughness 6, 10 wounds, which is good, except that 10 wounds puts them on the threshold, uh, the artificial threshold, to be degraded, which is uh, pretty nice. And at only Toughness 6 with a 3-plus save... They are, they are not hard to kill. Um, some one like two random dudes with last cans are gonna shoot this thing. It's gonna blow up. Fortunately for it though, it is um, it has a 16 inch move, so it can deploy very defensively and then move very quickly to get into position to fire, which is the benefit that all land speeders have. It's one of the reasons that we've seen a lot of land speeders in the competitive meta for Space Marines recently. I think the Tempest obviously is really powerful, uh, just from a stat line standpoint as well, but. In 9th edition, the ability to deploy defensively, regardless of whether or not you're going first, and then move out and attack aggressively is really powerful, and something that not a lot of factions have access to. So giving access to sort of kind of heavier style vehicles with more guns on them that can do the same thing is going to be pretty good. It's also randomly strength 5. Uh, almost all of the land speeders so far have a sort of standard Space Marine melee stat line. <laughs> uh, it's got three attacks. It hits on threes because uh, the guys can reach out and punch you. Um, uh, because it's a, you know, an open top vehicle, uh, but it is strength five, I guess, to, uh, represent the fact that they're just ramming you with a car. It has a whole smorgasbord of weapons, uh, as befits any Primaris, uh, Primaris vehicle, and it comes in with a hammer strike missile launcher, which is ba effectively a flat three damage crack missile, uh, actually a little bit better than a crack missile. It comes in at, a uh, at a base AP three, which is very nice. It's ba it's a lot it's a lot similar to the I think the weapons on the um, the Corvus Black Star have a similar stat line, uh, but two shots strength eight flat three damage solid that's pretty good. Um, it has two crack storm grenade launchers on the side here, so these are the strength six. Uh, they, shoot, they shoot crack grenades. I mean that's what they do. Nice to have, but nothing to write home about. More importantly, um, I think it has this melted destroyer on the front here, and uh, <laughs> I think on all of these variants, as uh, impressive as the turret weapon is, I think the main weapon is going to be this this hull mounted uh, front you know, uh, gun here. And in this case, it's a melta, it's a, uh, multi melta with three shots instead of two. Um, interesting that they didn't put these on eradicators too, but, uh, we'll take what we can get <laughs> with, the, with the 12 shot eradicator squads. Um, but that is a pretty, a pretty sick stat line, uh, on that weapon. Three melta shots uh, is pretty good. The downside is this nine power level. I think, uh, that is a lot for this thing. Um, it, it has, some pretty okay damage output. I mean, compared to a lot of stuff in the Space Marine faction, it's actually kind of disappointing. It has a, it's a lot of weapon profiles, and it's going to do some ser sig some significant damage. Having a fast movement is also good, but it is T6, three up save, ten wounds. Uh, I mean, it's just going to go down like a like a sack of bricks. And then at nine power level, you're probably expecting it to be 150 to 180 points, which is like what a price tag on this thing. Um, I don't know. If this is, if we're really going to see a lot of play here, to be honest, the platform is good and the weapons are good, but ugh, that's so expensive for something that's going to get to shoot one to two times and then blow up. That said, we'll have to see what kind of support land speeders get in the new codex as well. It may be that affects like skilled riders that give them an invulnerable save are going to be much more prevalent and uh, we have some additional support that they can use. Um, we'll have to see the full codex to make a real judgment call on them, but um, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, the model's pretty cool. I don't know. I don't like this guy. What's he doing? Why you got to put three intercessors into a into a one vehicle, ten wounds? Just put one dude in there. Have servitors around the other weapons. Come on, Space Marines, what are you doing? You got servitors in your uh in your Storm Ravens. Why you, why you got to put regular Space Marines in your land speeders? I don't get it. I guess it wouldn't attack as good in melee, uh, which is interesting. It loses attacks. I guess these dudes die as it degrades. Oh my god, I love it. <laughs> We're forging a narrative. They're just they're sitting out there in their open top vehicle, no canopy, just getting shot. <laughs> One thing I, sh I do want to mention, I don't know if we've really seen uh, vehicle stat blocks in 
ninth edition. I do like that they have the degrading stats in a different color and they just list the whole stat block through. So it's not like a separate stat block that you have to go and look up every time you want to see what degrades on you. It's very obvious and very clear right from the get go. And it's uh, it's a lot easier to reference. So uh, kudos to GW for making that a little bit more parsable. So we also saw some additional resculpts for stuff. We saw a multi-part Eradicator Squad kit. We saw a multi-part or multi-pose, I should say, Blade Guard Veteran Squad kit. They look great. We also saw a new captain with a heavy bolt rifle in Gravis Armor, I, I think, uh, which is probably going to be pretty playable. I, we haven't seen a lot of really good Gravis Armor captains, and a lot of times they're kind of, they spend a lot on uh, war gear that only shoots 18 inches or whatever, so they're not super good, but we'll see what, what weapons that guy has um, and whether or not he's he's playable over just his regular old Smash Captain. Last but not least here, we have the heavy inter intercessor squad stat block or a data sheet. Finally, uh, we saw these guys previewed a couple months ago and uh, another grainy photo um, and have been wondering what their role in the Space Marine Army is or in the Primaris range is. And uh, it, they're just they're just heavy bolter people. Um, which is honestly a direction that I did not expect. Uh, in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense. You get an intercessor squad with regular bolt rifles. So now we have a heavy inter intercessor squad with heavy bolt rifles. Sure, sounds good to me. So the first thing that we see, uh, seven power levels. So looking at around 130 to 150 points, uh, I think for this unit. And that was for the full five models. Uh, it's, this isn't a unit of three like eradicators. This is uh, for all five. So... Pretty reasonable points cost, uh, all things considered. I think that's um, around the 30 point mark per model. And you get that sort of that really tanky Gravis stat line T5 three wounds, um, which is really hard to get through, especially as a lot of people are moving towards two damage weapons to deal with Primaris infantry and with the new tactical infantry that's all going to be two flat wounds. Um, having three wounds is almost a, li almost literally makes you twice as hard to kill, uh, which is something that not a lot of people consider. And oh man, is is like peeling three Gravis armor models off of this able really difficult? Where if you have these little units of five, it's going to be really really tough to take down. Uh, it's going to be uh, really obnoxious. Um, what we don't see here is their battlefield role. So we, it, it, being an intercessor squad, it would make sense that this is a troops data sheet, but we just, as far as I know, we don't know yet. If they are troops, this squad is going to be sick. Uh, you're going to be able to put a unit of dudes that sit on the back line on an objective. Five Gravis Armored models is not easy to kill. It's not just something that you can throw a gunshot at and wipe them off the table like sometimes you can with intercessors. Uh, you have to dedicate some real heavy firepower to kill these guys, and they can take heavy bolters. Um, and we're seeing, finally here, uh, the new heavy bolter stat line uh, sort of being made manifest. Um, that makes it really good at killing, you know, like I said, Primaris infantry, uh, firstborn infantry, and even dinging up vehicles. Uh, it's basic, it's almost, the, especially against Tough to say it, it's almost the equivalent of an autocannon now that, that shoots three times, which is, uh, which is really nice. And, eight, and it, you know, for a while in 8th edition, the prevailing wisdom was that the autocannon stat line is one of the most efficient because it's uh, sort of medium volume shots. At a, at a medium damage at reasonable strength that can, that can hit infantry and vehicles alike. And uh, that's what a heavy bolter is now, basically. Um, you're going to be winning a lot of vehicles on fives, a lot of infantry on threes, and that's a really good place to be, especially if you're shooting three or four shots a, a pop. So what's interesting about this heavy intercessor squad is that it's kind of a weird Primaris equivalent to a tactical squad in that uh, you have these options for heavy weapons that standard standard intercessors do not have beyond, I guess, they're like auxiliary grenade launchers, like sort of the heaviest weapon that they can bring. But these guys get uh, options for a heavy bolter equivalent or some of these new heavy bolter variants that they have access to uh, for every five models in the unit. So potentially you could have 10. Uh, I imagine most of the time you're going to be bringing uh, four standard rifle guys as well as one uh, heavy bolter dude in the unit. That's probably going to be a pretty standard loadout. And then you're just going to be taking units of five to keep your model count down. But like I mentioned, sitting back on an objective is going to it's going to be tough to uh, remove at least even five of these guys. So I, I do think that they as backline objective holders with some longer range weapons, they're going to be very uh, powerful. Their suite of rifles that they can equip are basically all just upgraded versions of the standard intercessor war gear. They have uh, a heavy bolt rifle which is their stock uh, equipment which is effectively a standard uh, bolt rifle off of an intercessor with plus one strength 
plus six inches of range. Uh, that's fine. They also have a stalker bolt rifle equivalent in the executor bolt rifle, which is the same thing, plus six inches of range, plus one strength. And then they have the same for uh, an auto bolt rifle, which is their Hellstorm bolt rifle option, uh, which is, again, uh, it's an assault three, just like the auto bolt rifle, 30 inch range, strength five. Um, and honestly, uh, I think just like standard intercessors, the ABR equivalent uh, in this Hellstorm bolt rifle is probably the, the direction to go in. Um, that's a really high volume of strength five shooting. So even against other space Marines, the lack of AP is going to hurt, especially if salamanders continue to be good and you just keep bouncing up against uh, ignoring AP one. For the most part, because they're in they're an assault weapon, they're going to have combat doctrines for the greatest amount of time because you can stay in the tactical doctrine rounds three and four to give that Hellstorm bolt rifle um, one AP. If you are playing against salamanders or something similar, they're going to ignore all that, which sucks. But the fact that you just have a high, high enough volume of, of strength five, uh, you're going to be winning most space Marines on threes and you're just going to be forcing through enough saves that I don't think it's going to matter. So for that reason, having the highest volume of shooting, it just gives you the most options and just is going to be able to force the, the greatest amount of damage through. So in addition, we also have three variants of heavy bolters. We have the standard heavy bolter. Uh, we also have basically a similar line of variants for all of these heavy bolters that are analogous to their standard weapons. We have an executor heavy bolter, which only shoots two times, but is a flat three damage pretty spicy although only two shots is kind of sad um but a, a flat ap2 is pretty nice so i think you uh you, you probably put one of those through armor a lot more reliably um but then we also have a hellstorm heavy bolter which is a heavy four flat two damage which yeah oh that is mm, that's so good the issue here is that all the heavy bolters are heavy weapons so that they only benefit from devastator doctrine so they're going to be basically locked into their standard ap after round one getting to ap3 on the executor is very nice but for only round one round uh and losing a shot i'm not sure that it's worth it uh we'll have to see how it goes i do think again the hellstorm heavy bolter may be the way the direction to go in although you're going to be locking yourself into zero ap for a while so you're going to be bouncing off of armor most of the time um, that said, I think, you know, a lot of people are, are, are playing around in vulnerable saves right now. So pushing th past AP one or two, uh, is, may not matter quite as much. I don't know which variety of the heavy bolter is going to be better. It is interesting that there are new varieties of heavy bolters and it'll be interesting to see if any squads besides heavy intercessors get access to them. Um, I kind of doubt it, but uh, you know, you can hope, but I have to imagine that the standard loadout for this squad is going to be probably 150 ish points. And you're going to be bringing five guys with hellstorm bolt rifles, as well as one guy with some kind of heavy bolter, and that is just, that is so much damage sitting on a backline objective, shooting 30 to 40 inches down the table, and really just hammering somebody with a whole boatload of strength five gunshot, gunshots. Uh, this is not a standard intercessor squad that, you know, you have to keep super duper safe. The Gravis armor keeps them alive a lot longer than you could you would expect them to, I think. And they just have the ability to, to pump damage output uh, over and above what a standard uh, intercessor squad can do. Very impressed with this data sheet. I, I do think that uh, heavy intercessors are going to be a play in the metagame. We also got a couple uh, little previews about the upcoming books and things like that. Um, they talked about Death Guard coming out. We saw they, in uh, their overarching shots there, they had a couple new models. Um, there was a new character as well as looks like a new terrain feature as well we'll see about those later on uh we didn't really get much information on those but they also uh it looks like preview that the first codexes to come out with or codex supplements that come out after the space marine codex are going to be blood angels space wolves and death watch uh they did say that death watch unlike previous editions would be getting access i mean as a space marine sub faction now they're going to be getting access to the entire litany of space marine data sheets 100 data sheets, 98 data sheets, I think they said in the book, which is too many, but there you go. They also mentioned, interestingly, uh, kind of had my ears peaked for Death Watch because I like them so much, but they mentioned that there would still be access to specialist ammunition, but they only mentioned it in relation specifically to uh, veteran kill teams. So it may be that Death Watch are actually losing their access to specialist ammunition outside of those uh, some very specific units. So you might not be able to take, you know, <laughs> 50 Death Watch Intercessors or whatever and, and run them around or uh, these heavy Intercessor squads now shooting a uh, Kraken bolt rifle, uh, you know, bolt shots at minus two AP or something like that, uh, which would be a shame, um, but it uh, makes a lot of sense. I think Death Watch, if you're giving just wholesale giving them all of the Space Marine stuff would be almost impossible to balance. Uh, if everything just had the ability to wound <laughs> most of the game on twos. <laughs> but hopefully they, they maintain some of their unique uh, abilities. Otherwise, they're just going to be basically regular Space Marines with the ability to teleport, which will be nice, but I don't know. 
And we did see a little bit of a preview for the Imperial Armor Compendium, which finally, uh, that's going to come out. Hopefully we can stem some of the bleeding that, to, to Forge World data sheets that the meta is experiencing right now. It's And th theoretically, that's coming out before the end of the year. You know, take your time, G-Dub, I guess. That's fine. Uh, we're just getting killed by Tempest and Relic Contemptors over here, but, you know, you do you, uh, guys. You have a, a grand old time making your books over there. This was a, this has been something that the community's kind of been asking for for a while. I think the, the implication was that it would be out alongside 9th edition, but it looks like everything has been sort of pushed back in 9th edition. This 9th edition rollout is really going to take place over like six or so months um, as we get the first wave of codexes and some of these supplemental uh, items that will sort of define how the game plays. So it's going to be interesting early 2021 to see the state that the game is at because I think right now to be honest ninth edition has sort of left things a little bit in shambles and as these additional supplemental books come out to help refine the game and repair some of these gaping issues in the meta uh, it's going to look very different in uh, in six months or so and that's going to be very telling for the health of the the health of the edition uh, because right now it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's probably struggling a little bit to be honest <laughs> Anyway, that's basically everything that was in this preview from September 12th, 2020. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you all had a good time talking about all the new cool Space Marine stuff that's coming out with me. Hope everybody is enjoying 9th edition so far, getting a lot of games in. I know I'm playing a little bit on TTS right now, and it's pretty sick. We're just starting to get in-person uh, games going back in my area, so I hope everyone is uh, slowly transitioning back into in-person play, which is going to be exciting, and we can take some of the lessons that we've learned from TTS so far and uh, apply them to our games in 9th edition. Moving forward, I am excited to see where these new releases take the game, and uh, hope that they can repair some of the issues that I touched on uh, while talking about all of the new stuff coming out. I am a little worried about just, uh, you know, uh, endless cadence of Space Marine stuff and uh, leaving other factions behind, but we will see how it goes. want to give a big shout-out, as always, to my patrons over at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise those people are the greatest and uh the, the best kind of people if you want to join them like i mentioned before patreon.com slash tactical tortoise you can go in there you get all sorts of cool benefits you get cool early access to videos you get some exclusive videos and exclusive content out there you get there's a patron only channel in the, the community discord there's also a link to the community discord that anybody can join down below but there's a patron only one where we talk about all sorts of cool stuff a lot of math we talk about math a lot which is uh which is pretty fun and uh you get in there if you're a patron you also get early access to tournament pods for t5s2 uh, which we run on tabletop simulator out of the discord so if you want to join those more easily and quickly then you can do so uh, by joining the Patreon. So, yeah. Anyway, all my patrons are great, and I love them. And, uh, you know, everyone who watches this video is great, too. So, have a good one. Y you're, you're great. You're just the best. Peace out, everybody. Keep it classy, folks. And have happy wargaming. Wargaming.